Good morning. Not sure if you heard me earlier, but hello, Kaylee. Hi, Stacy. Um, we're going to start about 11 o'clock, 11.05. I'm just getting the chat set up. If the people that are on can hear me, let me know. Yeah, cheers to uh, BG getting released. Um, if you can hear me, let me know. And I'm also getting this chat set up here, too. But we'll start at 11.05. If you are going to be watch, well, if you're watching this after it's live, Check out the video description. I will put in a timestamp that um, will get you to where this video actually starts. The first 10 minutes is usually just set up answering a couple of questions. But we're going to be talking about um, genetic GMOs, genetically modified organism hybrids, heirlooms, organic seed labeling, and some seed storage. And again, about 11.05. If you have questions now, throw them out there. I can I can answer them while we wait for more people to sign on. Gardening Grounds is my public live. I'm going to be doing this two times a month on Thursdays at 11 o'clock. It will always be a set time. When the gardening season here in Maryland gets a little, a little more active besides frozen ground, I may do them more often than twice a month. But I'm going to do every other Thursday, 11 a.m., garden grounds basically i'll pick three questions and we'll talk about that if you do um subscribe and follow me or if you want to subscribe if you go to my youtube channel check out the community tab that's right there i list all the live events that i'm going to do um for the following month at the end of the month so at the end of december i put out a whole list of everything that i am doing for january and that will include public events like this and then I also have perk memberships, two tiers, and the short version is, is they're really set up to teach and answer questions and help you guys in your gardens. And they're gonna stay small. There's only gonna be 50, maybe 100 people that I think are gonna sign up for memberships, which allows me to do a chat like this, do live videos, and then I can answer everybody's question, I can help you out in your gardens, and it'll be in real time. This way you don't have to watch videos or search around for information. If I know it, I'll share it with you. Aaron, my favorite way to break up compact soil is one, when you first have a garden, um, and if it's compact, I turn it, I break it up all that it gives you a big jump instead of just doing no dig and waiting for years for it to loosen up i loosen it up but after that i go with just adding compost to the top a uh, couple of inches in the beginning of the season at the end of the season in the middle of the season i'm lucky enough to have the space to have a lot of compost but after that initial uh, initial <laughs> loosening of the soil i just put compost on top i stop turning it pretty much thereafter except maybe the couple of inches if i'm dropping some seeds but that seems to work best is compost over a long time just brings in the worms and everything and they naturally will loosen up the soil if you're if your soil is really compact you know don't be afraid to turn up the top 12 inches amend it up get it set up for that year and then maybe switch over to no dig but you're going to need compost Jack, I have heard of hardy kiwis. I've been growing them for 10 years and I've not gotten one fruit off of it. I'm in Maryland zone seven. You do need a male and female plant for my understanding. What's, and they survive and they get huge hedge form and stuff like that, but they're just not flowering here. Um, and I've gone through different plants over my years of growing them. So this year I'm hoping to add maybe more potassium, phosphorus, whatever's needed to maybe have them bloom more. They're also now four years old, so I'll see what happens. But I've just not had success with the hardy kiwis. And it's 11 o'clock. We'll start at 11.05. And again, if you're watching this after the live presentation, go right to the video description. You'll see a timestamp to when we'll start the content. Debbie, for the green stock towers, they're wonderful. I think they're the best on market. I am affiliated with them, but I've been using them for seven years. So, determinate variety tomatoes, plants that will get maybe two, three feet tall, maybe even four feet tall, produce and die off. I may put one of those 
per tier. I wouldn't pack in five plants into a tier, one plant per tier, but you want the smaller determinate tomatoes. If you're going with the bigger indeterminate varieties, then definitely I would go with a, nowadays I say a 10 to 20 gallon container. I sell fabric pots at my shop. You can find that in the video description. They work really well. But for an indeterminate tomato, I just find because watering and heat in the summer vary so much, you really do want a lot of material, if not the plant suffers. All right, last question, we'll get started. Helena, how about um, wood chips? Well, wood chips in the garden, I use in the walking paths, however I want. Wood chips on top of the soil is fine if you wanna use it as a mulch, but you don't wanna mix wood chips into your garden soil because it challenges that space for nitrogen because wood chips are so chunky, they're still decomposing, they require nitrogen from the bacteria to break them down and it can be a little bit problematic. But wood chip in paths, wood chips on the soil surface for mulching is fine. I would just move them out of the way and just don't mix a lot of wood chips into your soil. I like to use shredded hardwood, which is more like hair. It's like really, um, basically it's ground up several times versus just the first chipping and you get wood chips. And that breaks down a lot faster. So when I use that in the spring, it's mulch on my garden for the season. By the end of the season, it's fairly well broken down and I don't mind actually mixing that into there because it's so fine to start with. All right, so let's get started um, with today's garden grounds. I'm gonna answer three questions, I'm focusing today on GMO, what does it mean, hybrids, heirlooms, organic labeling, um, and then some seed, star seed storing, not seed starting, seed storing tips. And the reason being is it's the end of the season, new gardeners are coming in all the time, and the commercial garden industry, I personally think is direct organic gardening. We'll talk about that in the future. But the labeling on all these packages can be really confusing to seasoned gardeners like myself and a lot of you, and especially to brand new gardeners. And ultimately what I want to do with this series is just answer questions give you information so you can make decisions on how to spend your money. I want people to save money. I want people to have a great garden experience. So let's switch over to the other camera. And this is the main questions. We're gonna talk about GMO, genetically modified organisms versus hybrids, because there's a lot of confusion around there. And then heirlooms versus hybrids, because there's a lot of confusion around there. And then I wanna talk about organic um, seed labels or seed labeling and what that really means if that's something you want to value that's perfectly fine but I just want to talk about how it's used sort of as a commercial gimmick to get you to pay a little bit more money and then the bonus question is going to be with respect to seed storage so let me just think if I need to address anything else okay and then I also have perk memberships on my channel that's a paid um, membership, basically. I do a lot of live videos with respect to the perk memberships, all geared towards teaching. And basically what it allows everybody to get is a small chat, maybe um, you know, 25, 50, 75, 100 people at once. When I have that few people in the live chat, I can answer every question that comes through there in detail. So it's really gonna be the perk memberships are really gonna be set up as a classroom where you sign in. The first tier perks are really just Q&A and a little bit of discussion. I have formal classrooms in there at the, at the second level. Bottom line is I will be able to sit like this for an hour, hour and a half, multiple times a week, answer your questions, and the goal is to help you have a better garden. So let's get started with genetically modified organisms or GMOs. Now, first of all, genetically modified organisms is the wrong really label um, when you cross one tomato plant with another variety of a tomato plant you are modifying that organism that's okay that's a natural way to do it it's just you know poll taking pollen from one variety of a plant and pollinating another variety of that plant and then you cross traits and sometimes you'll get something better. That's been done for millions of years. You're pollinating insects, cross-pollinate, they create natural hybrids, perfectly safe. 
They are modified organisms. GMOs really should be called genetically engineered organisms. Organisms, they're GEOs. I wrote an article on that a long time ago and put it on Facebook. The reason I would call it genetically engineered organisms or GEOs is because it can't occur in nature. It's a modification that's basically engineered by human beings. And they're basically taking the genes from other plants and blasting them into the genes of a target variety. That's the short version. <laughs> I don't know the exact technicalities. But by doing that, they are crossing genetic matter between species of plants that just can't happen naturally, just will never happen with cross-pollination. It can't happen, period. So these are engineered. They will never occur in nature accidentally through pollination. So the label GMOs is what you will see on seed packs. So let's just start with one. Anybody have any quick questions about GMOs? And why I look at those, let's reveal. Well, um, let me ask you this. Um, how many genetically modified organisms, plants, garden plants, garden related plants, do you think are out there? Just throw it in the chat line, like 5, 10, 20, 50, 100. Put the number out that you think is there. And then how many people think that you and I just say yes or no, could buy a GMO seed, a seed that's created by human beings that can't be created in nature. Or think about it if, if you guys don't want to post it. Thank you, Mama Bear, for being brave. She says over 100. Ryo says a thousand. I think Gardner Tom is saying zero maybe to us. Can we buy them? People are saying no. So here are the actual GMOs. Let me pull the shade down because the sun's coming in. I think that's better. There we go. So these are the actual genetically modified garden farm related plants that are out there. And there's only, what is that? Three, six, nine, ten. And there could be a little bit more. Maybe I'm missing some. But let's just say, you know, this many plus maybe up to five. You can see the dates of when they were created. These have to be created. Your GMOs have to be created. Starting in 1995, and you can see that these are basically farm crops. And that's the only people that can get GMOs are farms. It has to be mass scale farming. You end up having to pay thousands of dollars for these. You have to sign contracts. You cannot collect the seeds. You cannot resell the seeds. The only way to get them is if you have a farm and you're farming on a large scale. So we have apples, potatoes, sugar beets, canola for canola oil, papayas, cotton, squash, corn, soybeans, and alfalfa. That's all you need to really worry about in respect to GMOs. You cannot get any of these in a seed pack. And that kind of takes me to the next part of the discussion. What is all this labeling that is going on with the commercial garden industry? Like, what are they trying to do? Oh, and the answer is they're trying to get our money. Now, everybody who does this isn't bad. And I'm going to show you some of these seed packs in a second. Sometimes it's survival. Like if basically one company decides to put on a seed pack, non-GMO, because information is poorly transmitted out there in the, in the world, basic, well, in the world in general, some new gardeners think that GMOs are something they can buy and they don't want to buy them. And I respect that. However, you're being fooled. You can't get them in a seed pack. All right, so we're back to, well, we're going to move to the seed packs in a second. Let me just see if there's any question on here. And I think by looking at the answers, I think it's representative of how much misinformation is out there. People don't know if there's zero to 5,000 GMOs out there. And the answer is the number that I showed you, maybe a couple more that I missed. So... 
don't spend more money for a pack of seeds because it says non-GMO. All right, so let's go over to what happens. The example that I like to use is pretty much toothpaste. Toothpaste is, and you can see right there above the tomato, it says non-GMO, and this is um, fairy morse. Again, another example, non-GMO. And it's not these companies, they're not non-GMO. It's not, this is any seeds, non-GMO. It's not these companies that are trying to, to fool you. What hap happens is like toothpaste. So you have Crest, you have Colgate, you have other toothpaste. And then years ago, they come up with whitening. And then now everybody has to put whitening on the label because well, why would you buy toothpaste that's not whitening when you can buy Crest that says whitening? And then another toothpaste company will say, you know, platinum white. And then something will say, prevent uh, gingivitis. Um, does A, B, and C, or they'll say activating foam, and they just start throwing all these words out there, and we get fooled, you know, which is sad that companies do this. So like toothpaste companies that are always trying to find something to throw on the box to make you buy their product, seed companies started doing that. Somebody came up with I better put non-GMO on there. And then people started saying, well, if that seed pack doesn't say non-GMO, it must be a genetically modified organism. I don't want to grow that, so I'm not buying it. So as we continue down the list, we go to uh, Lake Valley. That says right there, non-GMO. Bentley Seeds, who I work with and am affiliated with and highly recommend them, non-GMO. And then we have Lake Valley again. And, and you get the idea. So, and then who is this company? Let's see, I can't read it easily. So, when the seed packs first came out, or let's just say pre-1995, before GMOs were out there, none of them said GMO, or none of them said non-GMO. These are the same seeds from 1994 and below that they are now. So. Non-GMO, it doesn't have to be on the seed pack. I hope that makes sense. Um, and I hope it saves you some money. Because what companies will do is they will charge a little bit more for non-GMO. They will charge a little bit more if it says organic. And that's what we'll get into next, um, well, shortly. So the next level, actually, let me check the questions real quick. Yeah, and Rio's Family Garden, you're right. All seeds are non-GMO that you get in the seed pack. Just want to be clear. It's the seeds here that are GMOs. They're engineered, modified by people, can't happen in nature, and they're used on farms. And that's how, we want to, how I want to distinguish that. All right, so then the next thing we get to... Let's go back to heirloom seeds and hybrids. So let's put the hybrids down here. So the question I would have to clarify this, are hybrids bad? Do, are they harmful to you? Are they something that we shouldn't grow? And the answer is they're not bad. They are created by very passionate gardeners that spend decades creating new varieties. They aren't harmful, and they are really basically following what nature's been doing for millions of years. You take pollen from one variety of an okra plant, you put that pollen onto the male flower of a different variety of okra, and you cross, and you see what you get. And that's how we get some really super sweet tomatoes, some really massive sized tomatoes. They're hybrids. And when people create hybrids, they're unstable, which means as you do the cross, and I think it's uh, Gregor Mendel who did all the P experiments in, I think, the 1800s. You can kind of look that up if you want, Mendel. Um, and basically, when you cross seeds, you get dominant traits that show up. You get recessive traits that don't show up. So when you're buying the hybrids, you have to buy the crossed seeds. And you have to keep buying them until that hybrid eventually becomes a stable uh, cultivar. And 
that means that when you plant a hybrid seed and then you save the seeds, if it's not a stable cultivar and you plant those seeds, you're not going to necessarily get the same exact tomato that you grew that year. It's a little bit confusing, so let me re-explain it. You grow a hybrid plant, you take the seeds, you expect to get the same plant that you took the seeds from, but the next year you get something different and that's all has to do with uh, dominant genes and recessive genes and stuff like that. Um, over time, the hybrids can be stabilized so that when you take the seed from that year and you plant it again next year, you get the same exact crop. So when you're buying hybrids, you are spending more money. You're spending more money because people spent a long time trying to create them. You can't save the seeds and get the same exact plant the next year. So you're always having to buy the hybrids again until eventually they become stable cultivars, which means you take the seeds, you plant the seeds, you get the same plant. You take the seeds, you plant the seeds, you get the same plant. Eventually heirloom or eventually hybrids become stabilized. And you know, if 50 years go by, that plant that was once a hybrid may be considered an heirloom. So let me just show you some of the examples of the heirlooms and ask your questions. It's a little bit confusing, but I don't want people to not buy hybrids because you think they're bad. And I also want people to understand that hybrids might be a little bit more. And years ago, I did a video um, <laughs> kind of disrespecting the hybridizers or the people that create hybrids because I didn't fully understand it. And I basically was saying, you don't have to spend the extra money. You don't have to. But if you are, you're going to get a quality that just didn't exist, that somebody had to create out of a passion. And I think that is, you know, worth the money. Here. So we have right here, this is a baby bubba hybrid. So this is okra. For people that um, don't know okra, okra can get to be 8, 10, 12 feet tall. It's humongous. This is an okra created as you know, by people cross-pollinating that you can grow in a container. Then you have cucumbers. This one might be a cucumber. I have to read the back. I don't remember. Um, that doesn't need pollination. It actually just forms a cucumber. It's a hybrid. And then we get to this one. This is a gladiator. I mean, check out the size of the tomatoes in a person's hand. Again, created to create larger tomatoes. Honeycomb, it's a hybrid orange sweet tomato. Nothing wrong with those. And then this one is a herbless hybrid for digestion reasons. Sweet cucumber hybrid. So hybrids and GMOs often get confused. People sometimes think a hybrid is a genetically modified organism created by people. That's why I want to call it GEOs. Hybrids are modified. They're hot, modified through the rules of nature and they could technically naturally occur in nature. So you have the hybrids and then you have the GMOs. All right. I'll answer the question. Um, Are hybrids better than heirlooms in a second? Let me just check the questions real quick. I say I sparked a debate on toothpaste. I mean, it's crazy. You go out there and it's platinum white and white white and triple white and triple whitening. It's just crazy. Debbie, yes. If you save an heirloom seed, it's an heirloom seed. I'll talk about it more in a second or a stable cultivar, which means the characteristics of that plant are stable, planting to planting to planting. So yes, an heirloom is stable. You will get the same exact plant. Um, Steven, what are your thoughts on saving seeds from a grocery store? From the grocery store, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, however, you really don't know if they're a hybrid and the risk of not getting that exact crop as you think you're getting is higher. Um, but they also sell a lot of heirlooms at grocery stores. So you get a lot of heirloom tomatoes, heirloom peppers. Um, you just have to know what they are and they don't easily tell you what you're buying, whether or not it's a hybrid or possibly an heirloom or if it's a stable cultivar.
Right. So Urban Chicken Mama, we're going to talk about that next. All right. So we got talked about the heirlooms and the hybrid. So the organic seed labeling, I have. Let's just go over that. And again, this is organic. Different companies. You know, nobody's necessarily doing anything wrong. Organic. Organic. And organic. So here's my question to you all. What makes a seed organic? And is that seed better than a plant, than a seed, sorry, than a seed that is not organic. Just think about it for a second. I'm going to move these out of the way. Get ready for the next part. Those are the heirloom seeds. But yeah, just think about what exactly does that organic label mean? And I'm going to show you an example of some seeds here. These are carrot seeds. Can anybody tell me if these are organic carrot seeds or non-organic carrot seeds? And what could a seed of this size possibly have in it or on it that would cause it to be problematic to you and I or organic or not organic. Let's just see. And a lot of people are saying grown organically or grown with organic methods. And you guys might know exactly what that is. A lot of people don't know what that means. For instance, a farm that has used the chemical type fertilizers, which in my opinion aren't toxic, they should be used infrequently, if at all, we need more compost. If that soil had non-organic fertilizer on there, you have to wait three years. And now the soil is deemed clean to grow seeds and call them organic. And there's other things too. Um, I learned that when the machinery is being cleaned, for the seeds being kind of spun through there, they have to be cleaned with products that meet an organic standard. The point being is that the plant itself isn't produ producing a better seed because it's grown organic, organically. A lot of people argue with me around that. Um, a plant grows better because you take care of it organically, but the final seed is not influenced one way or another. So in my opinion, if you want organic seeds, I understand it. And just notice that you're paying a little bit more because organic fertilizers are being used. There is no technically no chemical spray put on them. And the equipment that's being used to package them is cleaned organically. But at the genetic level, the seeds are no different. And I think it's fine, you know, if that's what you you want to purchase. What I kind of believe more is purchase your seeds from the smaller mom and pop companies that you trust or companies that have been growing their own seeds and they grow them organically and they have a passion, but don't not buy a pack of seeds because it's not labeled organic. I just want to be clear that you're not getting anything toxic. The only <laughs> seed that I worry about is the seeds sometimes when they're coated pink or green and they're going to say treated seeds. Don't buy those. I don't recommend those because the actual chemical treatments on there are usually for a fungicide or fungicide and they can harm people, you know. Um, realistically, probably it doesn't matter in the big picture, but those are the only seeds that I would worry about. So if they say treated and you open it up and it's like this pink color or this, you know, lime green color, it's been sprayed with, a, uh, it's been coated with a, um, a fungicide. Don't buy those. Let me just see what people... Um, wrote back in respect to organic.
And two gals, you're, you're pretty much right. She says, I think all seeds are organic unless treated with a chemical substance. So when I don't have an example here, but you, oh, maybe I do. I think I do actually. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Here we go. Let me switch back. Oh, I'm still here. USD organic. Market more cucumber, three grams, two dollars and forty nine cents. Same company. Doesn't have the organic label. They both have the non GMO label. A dollar seventy eight for two point five grams. So it's seventy cents per half gram for a package that is not labeled organic. It's 80 cents per pack for a plant that is labeled organic. So you're paying a little bit more. Same variety. Now look at this. Right at the bottom, it says 68 days to harvest cucumber. Mark it more. <laughs> the ones that aren't organic are 60 days to harvest. So I don't know what that means, but labeling can be misleading. The seeds, going back to what uh, the state, the comment that two gals left is most of the seeds were organic anyway nobody is really like burpee seed company isn't necessarily one growing their own plants they're just importing the seeds from somewhere but nobody's growing a field of chemically treated non-organic seeds and then across the way they're growing this highly regulated organic seed of the same varieties they're all pretty much you know, organic to start with. If they do happen to spray their crops, that would be a concern, but it's not done a whole lot. When you're doing seed production, you're not so much worried about the leaves and the growth. You know that you're gonna get flowers, you're gonna get seeds, you know, it's up to you. I just, my point is it doesn't matter to me if you want the organic label or not. I just don't want you to feel like if it says non-organic, you're getting something toxic or poisonous to you. And if you want to pay more for something that's organic and meets all the standards that are important to you, that's fine. But, you know, so you know. And they're right. So, um, Kaylee, there aren't a whole lot of seed growers. A lot of companies import their seeds from the same place. So just because it's packaged with different companies, it's the same exact seeds. But that's something that, that I recommend is that you learn about the seed company that you're buying the seeds and find out if they're growing on fields or where they get their seeds from and really get to know the company itself, who runs it, um, how it's run, what are they producing and spend your money that way. That's better than I think spending it based on what labels are. All right, let me have a sip of coffee. In the Garden Ground videos, the series will go about 30 to 45 minutes. So let me clear these out of the way. And then heirlooms versus uh, hybrids. So we have a couple heirloom seeds. Well, there's a lot of heirloom seeds. I really like them. Is this one of them? No, hold on. Here we go. So this is from Baker Creek. This is just an heirloom um, red leaf lettuce. This is Botanical Interests, who I think have some of the best looking packaging. These are heirlooms. You can see it right on there. This is another heirloom from the same company, basil. And then this is another heirloom. It's a pepper plant from um, Livingston. And you look for that label. Heirlooms are not better. Um, I love the history. So you have kind of a debate on what makes an heirloom seed. So the first thing is a stable cultivar. We talked about the hybrids. Hybrids, if you save the seed, doesn't mean you get the same plant the next year. When you have a stable cultivar, that means you save the seed, you get the same seed, or you get the same plant next year. Now, heirloom is defined by time frame. Some people think an heirloom seed is 25 years, stable cultivar, cultivar. Some people think it's 50 years, stable cultivar. Some people think it 
is a plant that never was a hybrid, that it's just been passed on generation to generation. And that might be 75 years or older makes an heirloom. And some people, you know, go with like 100 years. The Brandywine variety tomatoes, the Brandywine pink in the red, uh, Sudith strain tomato plant, around the 1880s or something like that. That's when that plant variety was discovered. That plant variety has been passed forward as it is. And same thing. So if you go back in time, you find a stable cultivar and we continue to just grow that plant that you know, has been a stable cultivar for 50, 75 years. So you kind of get to pick. I don't know what these different companies use to define what an heirloom is time-wise. So you gotta have to kind of research that. But generally speaking, an heirloom tomato has been around for, I would say, I really believe 100 years. I mean, that's what you're looking at. You're looking for a variety that has just been grown and grown and grown and grown and grown and grown and it has these really great qualities. Now, people say, is an heirloom better than a hybrid? So here's the thing. It's really based on your garden zone, where you garden. If you take a great heirloom that was grown in a non-humid environment for 50 years or 75 years, you bring it over to my garden that has high humidity, that plant could struggle because the humidity brings disease. The plant isn't used to humidity and it doesn't do well. If I get a hybrid that has been bred naturally to fight off leaf spot or humidity related diseases, that hybrid is gonna do better in my garden. So the answer is, it depends and that's really up to you. All right, so let's take some more questions on those subjects. I know that my opinion is not 100% right. I just want, to, want you to use this as information on making decisions on whether or not you want to pay a little bit extra for a label on there. And also I want to make sure that you're not scared off or think something's wrong if the label isn't on there. And that's really up to you and we get to create our gardens, you know, as we wish. Just, I'm just checking now for questions. All right, so we're going to wrap up with some quick seed storage question or a quick seed storage discussion. So these are Taylor beans. This is something that I collected. It's in a Ziploc bag. Um, you know, the air is out of there. I just squeeze the air out before I seal it. This could be put into a Tupperware container in the bag if you want double protection. This could the beans could just go into a sealed mason jar or Tupperware container. The idea is, is you want to seal it so there's not a lot of exchange of airflow and all that kind of stuff. Store them in the house that's, you know, 65 to 75 degrees. And a lot of your seeds will last three years, five years, seven years, 10 years. I've had tomato seeds that last 15 years. So with this whole discussion on seed packs, what I want you to understand is that you, that's the other thing that gets confusing. You're going to see the date on the back of the packs. I don't know if any of these have them clearly. I'm going to look real quick. I mean, they're hard to see. But on the back, you're going to find basically a use by date. That's really, that's really for the commercial industry, you know, that they have to label things so they know what they are. It doesn't mean your seeds are only good for one year is my point. So if you store your seeds, you know, in an airtight container, there's many ways to do that. Keep them in the house. You don't even necessarily have to refrigerate them. Just keep them someplace out of the sunlight. Your seeds can last, you know, years and years. So you can reuse everything that you see scattered on here. Some of these are two, three years old. They're not even nicely stored. They're just kept in my house and I use them year after year. So you can save a lot of money by just reusing your seeds, keeping track of them, not losing them. Now, the, I mean, I could talk longer about storing seeds, but it really isn't, um, I mean, there's not a lot to talk about. 
try and store them something airtight in the house, 65 to 75 degrees, keep them out of the sun. Your seeds are gonna last a long time. Now, I have a seed shop, The Rusted Garden. You can find me at therustedgarden.com. I sell seeds there. I sell little um, pill bottles that are green that I use, that I sell as seed storing containers. You know, that's a great way to do it. Save your pill bottles, save any small container. Something you can write on, you can label, and you can keep your seeds, you know, right in there. It works really, really well. So gardening uh, grounds is going to be, or garden grounds. I can't, I mean, I just started this. So sometimes I'm saying gardening grounds or garden grounds. Um, <laughs> it's going to be twice a month, Thursdays, 11 o'clock. If you want to subscribe, um, this is basically the format. If you go to my YouTube channel, check the community tab, you will see a listing of all the live events, the perk memberships and the public lives on there. It will tell you what, when the Gardening Grounds is gonna show next, and it's gonna tell you what the three questions are. So there's gonna be another one for the month of December. All right, so I'm gonna take about five more minutes, look at the questions. If you have any questions on what I just talked about or, um, Anything that comes to mind with respect to your garden, go ahead and throw it out there. And please subscribe. It makes a big difference. And like the video, um, you know, for the work I do for my garden channel. Sandra, I've heard mason jars, some say in a freezer. You just don't have to put them in a the freezer. Certain seeds need a cold period to stratify and be ready to germinate. Most seeds don't. Um, you, you, they just don't need to be in a freezer. So at minimum or at maximum, I guess, I would put them in a refrigerator where they stay cool, you know, at refrigerator temperature. But there's no need to put them in a the freezer. All of my seeds I keep outside in the house. Debbie, my seeds are mostly from other sources because the seed company grew. I select them with my brother of where we get them from. Seeds that I've hand selected will now be called um, hand selected. I have a handful of those that will be out there, but they really come from both places. And I would just need more space for the quantity of seeds. It, it, I would need more space to be able to do that. And that would become a full-time job, which would be kind of cool. Um, so perk memberships, if you go to my channel, um, you will see just membership show up on there. You'll see perks show up on there and you click on that and then you just choose what tier that you want to select. Um, you can also go to the community tab um, and ask me questions if you can't find it. And also in the body of most of my videos, it will be in this one uh, after I set it up after the live or any of my other videos in a pinned comment you can see ways to get to the perk memberships for my channel and you just click on there and go ahead and do that um eugene day that, that's a good idea the silica packs um, so when you're storing seeds, if you're in a place that's not air conditioned or it gets humid, even if you have air conditioner, uh, you, you could put in a piece of a paper towel or a silica pack that you find in pill bottles that just absorbs the moisture just on, well, and we'll end here on a side note, every seed generally has a drop of moisture in it and it's alive. If that moisture dries out, then the seed dies. The other problem could be that too much moisture gets to your seeds, they absorb that moisture and then they germinate. So you want to keep them dry, no humidity or moisture. So the paper towel, a piece of paper towel or a silica pack in there helps. You also want to keep them sealed so the moisture content in the seed doesn't evaporate. And that's really what makes a difference in saving your seeds. All right, I enjoyed this. I hope it makes sense that well, I know that it makes sense. I hope that you just kind of read seed packages and even fertilizer packages, anything related to the commercial gardening world, and just learn about what it means so that you can make informed decisions and save yourself some money. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all either at the next Live Perks event 
or in two weeks on Thursday at this time. Take care.